and everything that we face in the world as we are in the world but called to be separate from it. An eternal perspective sustains our hope. I know it does mine. <laughs> we are empowered to speak truth into a world that is lost and is dying, all the while holding fast to the guarantee of his purpose to restore and renew all things, wiping every tear from our eyes, even the ones that we've caused, as we hold fast to Christ, empowered by his Holy Spirit.
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1. Therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance, endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons or heirs with Christ. Quoting from Proverbs 3 primarily, my son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Even Jesus himself learned obedience through suffering, as Hebrews 5, 7 tells us. And in chapter 12, finishing with verse 7, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with us, his sons. Father, we thank you for your enduring presence, that you fill us, that you empower us, that you strengthen us that you give us the, the, the will and the motivation to press on when everything seems like it may be pressing against us or pressing down upon us or trying to hold us back. Lord, we thank you for the struggles and we thank you for the joys of this life as you use all things for our good as we, are, as we love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, we ask that you bless the remainder of our service and that you would empower our ears to receive what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Each and every one this morning, especially as we have a nice warm sanctuary, uh, you may not have been aware, or maybe you were aware, <laughs> that the heating system was not working. <laughs> Joyce, you're saying you weren't aware of this? <laughs> no, we are very thankful. I, you know, as I, I reflect on how God just pulls things together um, and how it happened this week that the, uh, the technician who was on a massive job somewhere else carved out time for us and was here and took care of our issue. And uh, we're just so thankful the way that has worked and all those who were involved in bringing that about. So I'm going to pass the guest list around. And as we've said before, it'll go down this side and then come up this side, down this side. And we don't have to go any further, I think. Or, yes, one more in there. So that would be great. Just a couple of announcements before Bill comes and uh, challenges us from the word concerning the Holy Spirit. Jay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I definitely was not aware of that one. So thank you, Jay, um, for that. Uh, we will have our Sunday school hour in a time of prayer before we uh, move forward in the coming months to have more along the lines of um, Bible study, specific books, and different things like that. But we're taking the month of October to spend time in prayer. So I would encourage you to stay for the Sunday school hour that's going to be led by the North Barry DLT team um, and to just come together as God's people for prayer. In the bulletin, there's a couple of things in there. If you just look at those for some dates and some information, uh, particularly about the change of plans, I'd encourage you, whatever questions you have, interaction, please see any one of the elders um, on that, and we'd love to sit and talk with you concerning those things like that. Um, at this time, one of the exciting things that we have going on this month is Operation Christmas Child, and so Min is graciously... Uh, agreed to head this up for us. So I'm going to invite her up now to uh, share concerning that. Um, there will be a video first, though. So I believe that we're ready for the video. And then we'll go from there. And then you can just come right up. Okay. 
Don't forbid them. For such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus. Children are being discipled. And children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share the faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said. Let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl, who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope, that they have joy. And it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill His redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year, the Operation Christmas Show, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach children in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. My name is Min Ku. I'm so excited to be part of this uh, fun activity and it's really uh, meaningful for our family too. So we like to invite all of you to be part of this. As you have seen the videos, there's many ways you can help. You can bring the items like uh, school items, uh, toys, or hygiene items. You can donate also. Uh, you can bring your finished box. You can make your own unique box as a family. You can uh, put the stuff. I will send out more information what items will be can be included or not so that you can make your unique boxes and you can put your card, your family pictures in the box and you can bring to the church or you can also donate money. Like my little daughter, she loves shopping. She loves shopping for toys. So if anybody don't have time but you want to give, you can give uh, the uh, money donations so the church can go to buy the items to give as well. And as I search more that each box to deliver to the uh, countries, that there are about 100 different countries to go around. And to deliver this one box, they suggest $10 donations because of the shipping and because of collections, all the details that they have to do it. So if anybody want to separate your uh, donation for delivering and uh, those uh, shipping, that will be great too. So I'm as you see on the bulletin, we said November uh, 11th is that our last day that we will, we will collect the donations. So we will start packing. And if any of your family member or children, anybody wants to come to join us for packing, November 11th is a Friday after school 3.30 to 5.30. You're welcome to come and help us to packing. And you can make a card. You can uh, do fun stuff with us. So I really welcome all the church members to part of this. And most of all, if you can pray for this Ichi box to go around the world, that would be so amazing. So thank you. If you have any question, let me know or Sarah knows. We're going to work together. Thank you.
Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for the time we have to study your word, to worship you in song, and to consider outreach, not just here in our country, but around the world. We also keep in mind this morning the challenges over in Ukraine, those in Florida who are still recovering from Hurricane Ian, and also in North Carolina this week, five families who've lost loved ones at the hands of a 15-year-old gunman. And we just pray for all of those who are going through times of trial and difficulty this morning. And as our dear family here also has their own challenges, that we would keep in mind that you know those difficulties before they occur. You don't promise to keep us from them, but to walk with us through them. And so we ask you would sustain and encourage each one here that also as we look to one another, perhaps we could day, today be the eyes and ears and hands for you for an embrace, a kind word, a nod, a spoken word of prayer as we leave this place in a few minutes to go back to our mission field after Sunday school to be ambassadors for your son. We pray this to the praise of your glory. Amen. Our topic for this morning is the third person of the Trinity off time in a Christian church, which we are, we focus understandably on the work of Christ on the cross, but remember that our God is a triune God. It's God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's basically the stagehand behind the scenes. Does not draw attention to himself, but draws attention to Christ and does some important work of which maybe you are not even aware work in your life and in mine and in our world. So we'll be looking at that this morning. We're basing much of our work these days on the book put out by our Association of Churches, Evangelical Convictions. I did not use it at all this week, actually. I've done some research on my own. I did check last night and saw that we're on the same page. Actually, not literally, but they covered things that I had covered and I covered some things they did not. So be aware of that as we go on. The Holy Spirit, our Article 6 of our Statement of Faith reads as follows. We believe that the Holy Spirit in all that he does glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt. He regenerates sinners. And in him, they're baptized into union with Christ, adopted as heirs in the family of God. He also indwells illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. Our ability to do God's work is never our own ability. It's an empowered ability by the Spirit of God as he works in us, through us, and as we'll see in a moment, abides within us too. When we come to the topic of the Holy Spirit, I won't give you all the text because we'd never get through it from the Old Testament to the New. From the first chapter of Scripture, there's reference to the Spirit of God. The third person of the Trinity, again, to be specific, we have in Scripture in Hebrews 9, 14, the eternal Father, eternal Son, and eternal Spirit. God did not become those three persons. He's always been those three, which means our eternal God, our triune God, has had fellowship with himself long before creation ever took place. If there was one God, one person, would one wonder if he was eternally lonely until he made other creatures like ourselves. No, he had fellowship with himself. He's called the Spirit of God, the Divine Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, Spirit of glory, Spirit of grace. Spirit of truth, spirit of holiness, and God's good spirit. He's to be highly valued because, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, he not only knows the things of God, he makes them known. If you are a student of many things, as I try to be, particularly my love for astronomy, there are times where I find my mind going, oh my, I can't grasp all this. So I look through my telescope at things that may no longer exist. Light from the sun takes eight minutes to get here. I'm looking at nebula, galaxies, globular clusters that may have long since passed away. 
And some things we'll never see because they're so far away, the light won't get here in our lifetime even to see what's there. I think of that and I say, my goodness, as in Genesis, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters as God said, let there be light. The Spirit of God was very much involved in that work of God. In the book of Corinthians, I mentioned, who among men knows the thoughts of man except the Spirit of man? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows but the Spirit of God. And he goes on to say that what he would speak as an apostle were things, not the Spirit of the world, but given by the Spirit of God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Not many things are free. God's grace is. And one of the roles of the Spirit of God is to etch upon our mind and heart that God's gifts for us, God's promises to us, are already paid for by Christ. We're told in Scripture he was given by God the Father, given by Jesus. How can that be? Because when God acts, he acts as God. There are texts that speak of the Father sending the Spirit, other texts of Christ sending him. Jesus referred to him as a helper, a parakletos. And I'm a sailor. I have a pair of cleats on my boat which help me with the bow lines or the jib lines or later on the dock lines. A pair of cleats, a parakletos, helps me along. The Spirit of God helps us in the work that God has for us and pours out God's love in our hearts. From Romans chapter 5, verse 5, the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Spirit of God. Every now and then, perhaps you may feel that closeness of our Lord and his gracious chesed, his covenantal love. The Spirit of God's driving that home. Now, we know God's a God of justice and mercy and wrath, also of grace. Times when we are very focused on things we've thought, said, or done we shouldn't do, and we fear him, reverential fear, the Spirit of God says, come on back. He's the original mon back. Come on back to the Lord. He convicts and he also comforts at the same time. He pours out the love of God into our hearts. It's, he wants us to sense and know the love of God. With that, we're told in John's Gospel, chapter 16, he has another role of conviction. That he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, we can harden our hearts and the world can against the conviction of God. But his work never stops. We can become calloused to it. When I was a young boy and spent my summers in New Jersey, as Bob and I would thankfully take off our shoes, we called those from New York who wore shoes to the beach a bunch of shoebies. We got our shoes off, but those first couple days going across that blacktop outside my grandmother's home was hot. And those stones, the gravels we got towards the beach were hard, and the sand was so hot we got our surfboards and jumped in the water. End of the summer, we were going across the blacktop, the stones and the sand with no problem. What had changed? Our feet had gotten calloused to what was there. And so one of the roles of the Spirit of God is to continually convict the world of sin, and we're part of that world, of righteousness, what God has for us, but also of judgment to come. We sometimes wonder, why doesn't God judge right now? Well, if he did that, none of us would last very long. The scriptures say God is not slow concerning his promises, some consider slowness, but is long-suffering toward us, not wanting anyone to perish. And so he's to be highly valued, particularly for making God's word clear and also the love of God sensed. Actions with which he's credited. I mentioned a moment ago from Genesis chapter 1 where the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep moving upon the surface of the water. And Job writes in chapter 33 of his great book, the Spirit of God has made me. Again, God acts as God. Father, Son, and Spirit. When God acts, all three persons are involved in some way. But particularly as we're coming to God's Word this morning, one aspect of the Spirit's work is to illumine God's Word and even inspire God's Word. Men didn't just write it thinking through what they wanted to say. They were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. In Zechariah the prophet says, the words the Lord of hosts has sent by his spirit through the prophets. Or likewise from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, which have not entered in the heart of man, all that God's prepared for those who love him, God revealed them through the spirit who searches all things and knows the deep things of God. God's spirit is our school teacher. 
who make some of those things clear. We're told in Ephesians 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of sp the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so when we come to Scripture, not only did he help to... Uh, produce it by the confluent activity with men, but he inspired it, he makes it clear. He turns the light on. I've talked to students at Norwich who come to faith in Christ. They read a passage of scripture they've read before, and having come to Christ, I understand it now. It's like the light switch went on. I often walk through our house with lights off. My wife is a light turner on her. I'm a turner offer. It's a guy thing, I guess. And I sometimes, with my blind left, I will walk into a wall or those kind of things. Lights help to see what's going on. The Spirit of God illumines God's Word. We're told in 2 Peter chapter 1 that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of just one's own interpretation. No prophecy is ever made by human will, but men who are moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so what we have before us in God's Word is a direct byproduct of the Spirit of God's confluent activity working upon individuals to author and pen things we can now study. We know God's truth. It is also intriguing to know that he's one who reveals the future. Now, I made a sermon at Norwich recently from Luke's Gospel where we found in some asides there, and demonic work, etc., we're told in Scripture to avoid soothsayers, mediums, tarot cards, all that stuff. Why? There's something to it. Just yesterday, I was at a wedding where someone was talking about them visiting a medium. And some of the things that she'd been told came true. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm sure that's true. But at what cost? We come to Scripture for what God wants us to know and do not get near what God says don't. Here the Scripture says in the future, he told Simeon by the Holy Spirit, he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. And there's the infant child Jesus brought by Mary and Joseph to the temple. And Simeon had been told by the Spirit of God, you won't die until you see Messiah. Agabus, who's mentioned several times in the New Testament, chapter 11 of Acts and also chapter 21, indicates by the Spirit there'd be a great famine in all the world during the reign of Claudius, or he also was the same one who takes the Apostle Paul's belt and binds his feet and hands and says, the Spirit of God says this, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. God had revealed by the Holy Spirit to one of his own prophetic guys what was going to occur. In fact, the Apostle Paul says for himself that the Spirit of God had revealed to him, Acts chapter 20, verse 23, in every city saying, bonds and afflictions await me. Now a question for us, if the Spirit of God said to you or me, we're going to go to this spot, you're going to suffer tremendously, will we still go? Well, I find intriguing with St. Paul's understanding of this being true, he still went forth. He was told earlier when he was first after his blindness on the Damascus Road what things he would suffer for the cause of Christ. You go through Corinthians, shipwrecks, beatings, floggings, and left to be dead they thought he was stoned. I don't mean by stone. I mean, he was stoned with rocks. I wonder what kind of ministry I would have if Christ's spirit said to me, Rev, to do this, you're going to suffer tremendously. He reveals the future. In fact, we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. What's this mean, my opinion? I think there are clergy behind some pulpits who are giving doctrines of demons. They're giving the philosophy of our day the mores and folkways of our society, and caving to societal pressure rather than saying, thus says the Lord. Now, we can do it this way with God's word or this way with God's word. Mm -hmm. We're told to share the word with respect and gentleness. It's his kindness that draws us to repentance, St. Paul writes. But we have to speak truth. When I go to my physician and I'll see my surgery for my cancer from five years ago in the December, I want the surgeon to tell me the truth. Whether I want to hear it or not, tell me what's going on so I can address it. Going to a place is to have our ears tickled is not what we need. We need the truth. And so one of his roles is to also reveal the future.
The scripture sets forth that the Spirit of God was involved in, and is involved in individual lives, resting upon people, coming upon individuals, entering into them, being poured out or poured forth on individuals. But in the Old Testament, it could be taken away too. We'll talk about a difference in that in just a moment for the believer today. He could be removed. His indwelling presence then was temporary, not permanent. It was he who would stir up God's people to action. Now, as an aside again, I think I've seen people behind pulpits or lecterns like this who stirred up their people, and it was that individual stirring, not the Spirit of God. It's dangerous sometimes what people who are leading a church can do. Our agenda, a person's agenda, is it God's agenda. I believe, by the way, in the priesthood of believers, even as we have coming on later on this year, another summit, to absorb from our people what is God saying to you. We don't work in a vacuum at all. But here, the Spirit of God has to move us. That we say, yes, this is of Him. We find through the epistles and elsewhere, He led individuals. He comforted individuals. He's called the comforter. As an aside on that, I mentioned he convicts of sin. If you feel in your conviction of a sin, how can God love you? That's not the Spirit of God. That's the adversary. The Spirit of God says, yes, it's a sin, and God loves you. Christ paid for that sin. Come on back. He's the comforter with conviction. He's not there to destroy or put down but to lift up and transform. We're also told in terms of individuals, he's the individual or he's the person, the Trinity, who overshadowed the Virgin Mary so she could bear the Christ child. How that was done, I haven't the foggiest idea, but Dr. Luke, a physician, writes about that in the gospel I'm teaching at Norwich right now. With regard to Jesus, at Jesus' baptism, as if a dove, what did they see happening? The Spirit of God descending upon him as, if you will, a dove. We're told in Luke chapter 4, he anointed Christ and sent him forth to pre preach and proclaim. He's being led by the Spirit of God. There are theologians I've read, and I actually believe this, I think it's correct, that Jesus as the perfect Son of God, still God, set aside the prerogatives that were his as God, emptied himself, as Philippians says, and some theologians believe that he was the perfect man, but the power for miracles was by the Spirit of God working through Jesus, that he set aside his prerogatives, and like us, what can God do through us if we let the Spirit of God lead? Why do I say that? We're told he was led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, but who led him there? The Spirit of God. At the outset of Christ's ministry, the Spirit of God starts at the outset, let's see how you do with this temptation and this trial that he filled and empowered Jesus to do healing and to cast out demons. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Christ says, I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. So isn't it intriguing if the eternal Son of God, still being God completely, didn't exercise his godly prerogatives, but as part of the Trinity, all that those miracles were done, were they done by the Spirit of God? It's possible here. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the apostles preaching there say, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power, how he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Well, he's also God. So why would the phrase say God was with him? Because that second person, a third person of the Trinity was working through Christ Jesus. A God-sized task takes God here, and the dangerous thing is we could plot ahead with our agendas and God's not behind it. We're seeing the importance of his role, how he's involved in individual lives, including Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 verse 2, he gave orders to his apostles by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, Jesus offered himself up to God through the Spirit. From Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself up without blemish to God. 
I wonder if he could put it this way, in those times alone of quiet times where Christ is talking to his Father, if he indeed set aside those prerogatives that were his as God to exercise, is he saying, Heavenly Father, I need the Spirit to work in and through me or we can't do this. He offered himself through the eternal Spirit to God. I can't do this, we can't do this humanly without the Spirit of God working through us. We're also told in John 15, Acts 5, Romans 1, 1 John 5, that he bears witness of Christ. He points to Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, 26, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father will bear witness of me. I began by saying we don't often give enough attention to the spirit of God, but there are some churches where their main focus is the spirit of God, and that's inappropriate too. He would say, don't do this. I'm support staff, I'm God, I'm equally God, but my role is to point to Jesus and point away from himself. Any clergy who talks about themselves too much or their church or their work needs to say, I'm a signpost pointing to him. I hope you've noticed in the honor I have of speaking with us here, I try to use the word us and we, not you. Because if I do that, there are three fingers pointing back at me that this is a message for all of us, myself included. Apart from the Lord, I can do what the scriptures say? Nothing. I don't like that verse. Do you? But the text always says, also, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He affirms, 1 John 4, 2, that Christ came in the flesh. He reveals the mystery of Christ. 1 Timothy 3, 16, he vindicates Jesus. I read from the text there. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated by the Spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Revealed in the flesh, they saw Jesus, but he was vindicated, proof text, proven by the Spirit of God. What about specific assistance he has rendered in the past or now provides. We're told in John 16, he guided the apostles into truth. Having said that, do you recall how Satan tempted Jesus? He misquoted scripture. He quoted real verses. The Bible says, you can just cast yourself down, he'll pick you up. Jesus says, don't tempt the Lord your God. There's a battle of verses back and forth. When cultic leaders come to your door, there is the battle of scripture. And if we don't know God's word, we can be taken on a side trail very quickly. He guided the epistles of the apostles into truth. He empowered them for witness. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Wait until you're clothed from power on high. Don't do a thing. And then they would be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. We're told that the apostles spoke forth because the Spirit brought to the remembrance what Jesus said. Ever have times you can't recall what a conversation was about? When my wife puts her hands on my shoulders, I'm nodding my head and says, what did I just say to you? And I say, I have the foggiest idea. <laughs> we can hear and not listen. Ever have children like that? Wives would say, my husband's like that. Sometimes it can be reversed, but the issue, they spoke because the Spirit of God brought back to their mind what Christ had said. We're told that the men, many were unschooled, ordinary guys. Four fishermen who had worked together before Christ called them, by the way, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. A tax collector, a zealot. Christ has to have sent the tax collector and zealot out together. I'll be disappointed if he didn't do that. Ordinary people. Which, why, why? He can say to us, I can do extraordinary things through you by the Spirit of God. He came upon receptive listen listeners, Acts chapter 10, and he helps. Ever have times when you have a burden and you don't know how to pray about it? Ever just go, ah. try that. What happens when we can't even do that? Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. We don't know how to pray as we should. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I don't know what to say, what to do. Spirit of God, groan for me. It'll get home okay. 
I need not worry that I get it wrong to the Lord. Which mailbox do I use? Do I pray this to the Spirit, to the Father, to, to the Son? In our home, we have one mailbox. All our mail gets in the same mailbox. We can sort it out inside. The Spirit of God, one of his roles in assisting today is when I can't even think how to pray, and all I'm just going, I'm so burdened, I just go, and sometimes I can't even do that. I'm too exhausted. The Spirit of God says, I'll groan for you. I like that verse. Because sometimes words don't work, do they? He helps in that way. He empowers 1 Corinthians 2, 4, Paul states, My message, my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. There are great orators that say nothing. I've heard some things on television and radio of preachers, and they sounded so eloquent. I ended my listening to their program saying, what did they say? I had the foggiest idea what they were saying. So it's not eloquence. It's the Spirit of God working behind the message in power to emplace it there. And we find also he provides guidance for spiritual ministry. Think of the centurion, a non-believer, Cornelius, book of Acts, chapter 10. He's having his own quiet time. And while he's having his, the apostle Peter is having his. And the Spirit says to Peter, three men are looking for you. Go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings. I've sent them myself, the Spirit of God says. Well, they were Gentiles about to take Peter to the home of a Roman centurion who was occupying his country, and a Jew was not allowed to go in the home of a Goyim, a Gentile. He's breaking social mores, folkways, culture, tradition, and the Spirit of God says, do this, follow those three, and don't do it with any misgivings. It's behind, I'm, I'm behind this. Which also reminds me that when it comes to reaching out with the gospel, if God lays a burden upon our heart, listen carefully. I won't take time today, but I've had a number of times in ministry, I've been in trouble with church leaders and church people for doing what the Lord led me to do, meeting folk where no one else would go to them, and God used that time with them to bring them to Christ. But you went to that bar, yeah, I went outside the bar and got him out. Or went to a different church to hear another pastor preach. And I say, what did he say? So I could talk to my high school friend saying, what do you get out of the services? In the same sense, he leads us. And even Paul's itinerant ministry, he's about to go through Asia Minor. <laughs> the Spirit says, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them. And later on, he takes them to Macedonia with one man's voice. I tell the students in my office at Norwich when they're there, who's the most important person on campus? And they look at me, I have no idea. I said, until you leave, it's you. And I really believe that. When God brings someone to us that we had no catalyst behind it, and they say, you got a moment? Take the moment. It's a God thing. And treat them as the most important person around because they are. He redirects, he directs the apostles, he does it for himself. An especially important role that he has right now is what's called regeneration. What is that? Rebirth. The new birth. Being born again. We're told already he makes clear the things of God. He bears witness to Christ. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, he's involved in evangelization. St. Paul writes, Our gospel did not come to you in word only but in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Behind that word, proclaimed or written, there has to be the Spirit of God who brings it forward. Or it can come on deaf ears. The apostle who saw great results could have said, wow, look how God's using me. It's not what he said. He said, the gospel we proclaimed in word only, no, it wasn't only that, the power of the Holy Spirit was behind it, and he brought for conviction. He convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's his work. Which also reminds me, it's not my job to convict somebody else. Ever had a pastoral sermon where you could tell the pastor was preaching right at you? I've had, in my background, where a pastor was too cowardly to talk to a couple or person during the week, and in the sermon, because I knew what the situation was, they'd have an illustration I knew was written for one person or one couple coward. At the same time, if we just proclaim God's word, 
The Spirit of God will convict. I had a person once say, Rev, you don't give a lot of illustrations. I said, no, I let God's word do it. Because any illustration, why'd I choose that one? There's some good ones and some bad ones, but I am convinced if we came to hear God's word today, you'll walk out with different impressions on this same text and God will drive something home for you or for me. And it will be different because he knows our hearts and our minds and what we need to hear. We prayed before this service today for the involvement of our worship team in the message, but God, do what you want to do here. It might be a conversation you have as the service ends with a brother or sister in Christ here, an insider, a prayer they offer that that's why God brought you here, among the other things. Let the Spirit of God do that. We're told that the Spirit of God sets us free from the law of sin, of death, and provides liberty. It's almost as if it's a battle between Satan and the Holy Spirit, Satan or his demonic forces. How can God love you? Shut up. God loves you. The Spirit bringing freedom. Liberty. American liberty is nothing like the liberty that God gives in forgiveness of sin. We're told in Romans chapter 2, 15 and 2 Corinthians 2, he sets us apart, circumcises the heart. He cleans us up. Sanctification means being set apart for a distinct purpose. When the spirit of God works, he wants to set us apart for the Lord. And he, we're told, justifies and transforms, and he witnesses, Romans 8, 16, that we're one of God's kids. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're a child of God. Ever doubted your salvation? Probably. As a small boy, I received Christ at least 13 times. If I didn't mean it last time, I mean it this time. The Spirit of God says, look, you're his kid. The Spirit of God bears witness that we're a child of God. What's that mean? He brings assurance. I never did everything my mother or father wanted me to do, but I was always their son, and nothing can change that. If we're a son or daughter of God, he's still working to change our lives, but we're his kid. If you made the decision to receive Christ as Savior, he's got you. We'll see in a moment a special role of the Spirit of God that ties in with that. He spiritually baptizes us, I did that earlier, into the body of Christ. Now, as I mentioned, I do baptisms in the Dog River behind Norwich. I did one last week. I've got one in January coming up. The young man said, let's do it the coldest we can do. I said, fine, fine, I said, we'll do that. But there's a different kind of baptism. As in water baptism, we're placed in the water, symbolizing our death to sin and aliveness to Christ. We're told that the Spirit of God baptizes us, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, into the body of Christ. We're placed at that moment of salvation into the church globally, spiritually. Not a denomination, but all those that know Jesus Christ. By one Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, made a drink of one Spirit. We're placed into that body of Christ. In heaven, there's not going to be a free church compartment, a Baptist compartment, a Presbyterian compartment. We'll have to learn to realize we're part of the body of Christ. Probably you didn't even realize that. When you receive Christ as Savior, if, you did, if you've done that, then you were placed in that body of believers at that very moment. The Spirit of God says, okay, now you've got a family. We're also told that he indwells believers today. I mentioned earlier he could come upon, rest upon individuals and then leave. Jesus taught the Spirit of God abides with us and would be in us, John 14, verse 17. Paul writes in Romans 8, after in chapter 7, what a wretched man I am, who can deliver me, deliver me from this body of death? What can separate me from the love of Christ? Nothing. Chapter 8, You're not of flesh, but spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Him. Which means that the proof of our salvation is the Spirit of God's taking up residence in our life. Now look, I know He's everywhere present. What do you mean? That means we open the door and say, come on in and take over. We allow Him to indwell, not just the guest room for a couple days, 
but he's there permanently to stay. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, which was a messed up church initially, wasn't it? The second book of Corinthians is a wonderful book. They got their act together. But in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, don't you know you're the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you. You've been bought with the price. Glorify God with your body. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we're told, we know by this he abides in us because of the Spirit he's given to us. Here's the important part of that. He seals us. In the earlier days when a letter was sent, they would take a wax candle, meld it, and take the signet ring and push it in that wax seal, showing that this letter is sealed. When it was received by the intended recipient and the seal was not broken, it was secure. He seals us, First, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22, God sealed us and gave us his spirit in our hearts as a pledge. God seals our salvation. He assures our salvation. Ephesians 1, in him, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, having believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, given as a pledge of your inheritance, the redemption, God's possession to the praise of his glory. When it comes to the work of the church, he gives spiritual gifts, charismata, grace gifts, or spiritual gifts. I won't go through the list, but in Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 14, there's a whole list of gifts. Teaching, administration, encouragement helps to do our work we can't do on our own. God's Spirit gives each one of you at least one spiritual gift, at least one. What's yours? If you are here, our church needs you. Not just to be here, but to be used here. Read those chapters or get the notes later on. Look at that list of gifts and say, well, I wonder which one's mine. And employ it for his use. He imparts those gifts for edification of the church and evangelization of the world. An inward focus and an outward focus. And with that, he also fills believers. Now, when something's filled, it overflows. My father, who was a house painter, had a dear lady at a house he painted. She was actually a... Uh, lady that cared for a bachelor man in his 80s. And she would always give my dad a cup of coffee because dad loved coffee. And dad would say, Lydia, fill the cup of coffee, will you? So she poured it one day, filled up the cup over the saucer onto the table. Is that enough, Bill? He said, stop. He fills, he enables individuals. Craftsmanship in the Old Testament, wisdom, power, there's a whole list of people I won't go through. It says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. In the same way that alcohol can control our body, the Spirit of God says, I can take over and control and lead you. Be filled with the Spirit. We're told that those who preached the Word were enabled to preach because they were filled by the Spirit. If it's not filled by the Spirit, it goes nowhere. I'm about done. Here's the scary thing. How can we or others respond to the Spirit of God? First of all, I remind you, he's not a force or influence as some cultic leaders teach. How can I say that? Because we're told we can insult him. How do you insult a force or influence? We can lie to him. We can blaspheme him. We can grieve him. We can rebel against him. We can resist him. We can harden our hearts against him. We can attempt to quench his influence. This is not just an influence. It's the third person of the Trinity trying to work in us. But those things are how we can negatively respond. Or we can do, as the scriptures say, perform baptisms in his name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can set our mind on the things of the Spirit. What would you have me think about or do? We can live by the Spirit, serve in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, worship in the Spirit. And at the final book of Scripture, Jesus says in chapters 2 and 3, to the churches, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen. What's he saying to you or to us? We can respond positively or negatively. Again, he's convicting of sin. Or if the adversary is beating us up, he can convict us of righteousness. Hey, you're in Christ. Our judgment, don't take sin lightly. He will, he will deal with it. 
Yes, that means we're done. Let me summarize where we've been. These emphases for the Spirit of God, again, the often unmentioned third person of the Trinity, one, his spiritual regeneration of believers. If you're born again spiritually, the Spirit of God was the one that did that. Christ paid for it, but the Spirit of God was the one that convicted and consoled and brought you. The Father drew you, the Spirit of God brought about your rebirth. He provided for you and for me a spiritual baptism, placing us not into this particular assembly, although we're here, but a larger assembly of those who are called the saints of God, believers of that global church, ecclesia, ek out of kaleo, to call those called out to Jesus. He indwells you. So sometimes those convictions you or I hear isn't our conviction because we've said no so many times we're callous, but the Spirit of God's still trying to say, Rev, listen. And he tries to convict and also console. His sealing of believers. If anything, I want to emphasize that. He's given as a seal that says, if you've given your life to Christ, you and I are still stumbling towards maturity, towards Christ. But he says, I've got you. You're my kid. If Satan can't keep us from Christ, he'll make us doubt that we're in Christ. He seals that. And lastly, he fills believers for ministry. We dare not, once we know our gifts, do them in our own strength. I'll close with this. I was asked by a student, Rev, are you afraid of speaking? Absolutely not. Am I afraid of the responsibility of speaking? Absolutely. Because I know I could twist scripture. I could misrepresent scripture. Folks could come out of here taking something that I didn't do correctly. That frightens me because it says we shouldn't all be teachers, right? Why? Because we face a greater judgment. So we went fast. My suggestion, if you're interested, is Rev... Send me your email notes so I can check out the text. But that's a lot, and we're done. But that's great stuff. One of the foundations of our faith is God is triune, and his spirit is working in us, through us, and by us now. Father, take this portion of your word and use it in the way you see fit to the praise of your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. And I encourage you to bring a friend to our services too. Please do that.